In one of my previous videos, I talked about various police interrogation techniques. People commented with their helpful advice: "Lawyer up, stay silent, say nothing." Indeed, one has the right to remain silent and the right to legal counsel. Today, I'd like to talk about how to invoke these rights. Because you know what, the invocation of legal rights may be a little trickier than one might have initially thought. So, in this short video, let me tell you the story and please bear with me until the end. Research has shown again and again people attempt to invoke their rights but fail to do so in a legally valid manner. And this is because the invocations of legal rights need to be shaped in a particular form of language that can hold up in court. The reason that the courts, both state and federal, are quite strict about the language used for invocations of rights is that such utterances or the saying of such sentences have important legal consequences, and that is why a lot of the legal talk that we can think of all sound very scripted, standard, and similar. They almost always sound the same. I mean, think about it. By the power vested in me by the state of New York, I pronounce you husband and wife. Or we, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant guilty as charged. Or you are under arrest; you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. All these sayings sound so standard and so scripted because they need to be. Legal speeches have consequences. The mere utterance of these words will bring about specific legal outcomes that are intended and specifically designed to occur when these words are said out loud. So, of course, legal talks would sound quite a bit different from other types of talks. Now, the problem with this is that because most people are not trained legal speakers, we might be unaware that what we're trying to say when attempting to invoke our rights may not be legally efficacious. For instance, if I try to invoke my right to legal counsel by saying, "May I speak with a lawyer?" because I phrased it as a question, a reviewing court may not recognize this as a valid invocation, because instead of invoking my right in a clear manner, I merely asked a question about potentially invoking my right, and a police officer is certainly not obliged to answer this question of mine. So it is not advisable to try to invoke one's right in the form of a question or using softened and confusing or indirect language. But those types of language is exactly what one tends to use when dealing with the police. Social psychological and sociolinguistic studies have repeatedly shown that in situations of power asymmetry or power imbalance, the less powerful party tends to express themselves using hatched and indirect language. A police interrogation is certainly such a situation where power is quite unbalanced. Just look at my previous video; you will see that the interrogation is typically set up to give the police officer as much power and control as possible. In such a situation, it becomes even more natural for ordinary people like you and me to speak in an uncertain, indirect, and softened manner, thereby making it more difficult for us to correctly and validly invoke our rights. Let's take a look at some actual examples, some actual quotes of failed invocation attempts. Here are examples of people trying to invoke their right to legal counsel. They said, "Could I call my lawyer? Could I get a lawyer? Can I speak to an attorney before I answer the question to find out what he would have to tell me?" In all these three cases, the reviewing courts ruled that these invocation attempts were legally invalid because these were mere questions about the theoretical possibility of legal counsel, rather than clear, unambiguous, unequivocal invocations of the right to legal counsel. A few more examples. I think I would like to talk to a lawyer. It seems like what I need is a lawyer. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna call my lawyer. These also did not hold up as legally efficacious invocations because the speakers used softening language with qualifying clauses, which we should obviously avoid. We should also avoid asking the police for logistical help when invoking the right to legal counsel. For example, maybe I lost my attorney's phone number, or perhaps I cannot find his business card right now. Surely I could just ask the police officer to contact my lawyer for me, right? Well, in U.S. v. Train, 2006, the arrestee asked the police to help him retrieve his lawyer's business card, believing that he was invoking his right to legal counsel by asking the police to do so. The court subsequently ruled that it was not a legally valid invocation. Another case, Jackson v. Commonwealth, a suspect who was in a hospital asked the police, "Could I get a phone in here so that I can talk to a lawyer?" This request was also ruled as legally invalid because it was ambiguous, and again because it was merely a question. 
So, these examples above illustrate how one may fail to invoke the right to legal counsel if they did not shape their language properly. What about the right to remain silent? Let's take a look at a few failed invocation attempts. I don't got nothing to say. I don't want to talk no more. An arrestee responding to an officer's request to make a statement with, nope. All these were considered too ambiguous or too equivocal to count as legally valid invocations. Now, what about saying nothing? What about staying completely silent? Maintaining an absolute silence may also be considered as an invalid invocation attempt. Obviously, there can be differences among different geographical locations, but in general, as a matter of law, one needs to explicitly express oneself in order to invoke and claim one's right to remain silent. This may sound strange, but to invoke the right to remain silent, one actually needs to talk. One needs to express the invocation in a clear, unambiguous, and unequivocal manner in order to trigger constitutional protection. So, just staying completely silent may not cut it. And finally, there were also those cases where the combination between the refusal to answer questions and the request for a lawyer, so putting the two together, was also considered insufficient invocation of rights. Examples. I don't even want to talk unless I have me a lawyer to go through this. I'll be honest with you, I'm scared to say anything without talking to a lawyer. Someone responding to police questioning, f you, talk to my lawyer. All these were ruled as legally invalid. So we have established now that to invoke one's rights can be trickier than we might have thought. Some might not even know that we have these rights, and even if we know we have them, we might not know exactly how to invoke them in a way that is legally efficacious. So, how to do this right? Well, normally, we would imagine that all one needs to say is, I invoke my right to remain silent, I respectfully decline to answer any questions, I invoke my right to legal counsel, give me a lawyer immediately. But reality is more complicated than that. A number of cases have indicated that pre-Miranda invocation of Fifth Amendment rights could potentially be used in court against the defendant. See my other video on this topic linked above and below. This has led to the argument that it is wise and better to invoke one's Sixth Amendment rights instead of the Fifth. In his book, You Have the Right to Remain Innocent, James Joanne argues, don't plead the Fifth, plead the Sixth. The reason is, and I quote, You should not mention the Fifth Amendment privilege or tell the police that you wish to exercise your right to avoid incriminating yourself, because in this day and age, there is too great a danger that the police and the prosecutor might later persuade the judge to use that statement against you as evidence of guilt. So all one needs to say, according to Duran, is just four words and state them repeatedly to the police, I want a lawyer. All right, let me end this video by emphasizing that the content of this video is presented as general information only. The information contained in this video is not legal advice and should not be treated as such. Consult your own lawyer should you need legal advice. Let me also emphasize that this video is not meant to criticize any particular police officers, and I invite you to watch my other videos on the topics of policing and law if you're interested. Finally, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the right to remain silent. How does it work in your country? Have you ever invoked your right to remain silent in any citizen police encounters? And how did that work out? I'd love to hear your experiences and opinions, and I know you can't resist sharing, so leave your comments and thoughts down below. The examples that I cited in this video are taken from this research article. You have the right to remain silent, but only if you ask for it just so, the role of linguistic ideology in American police interrogation law, published in the International Journal of Speech, Language, and the Law. Thanks so much for watching this Rainy Ways random video. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.